We're ready to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to our OpenSIM webinar. My name is Jennifer Hicks. I'm the OpenSIM R&D Manager and the Associate Director of our National Center for Simulation and Rehab Research, uh, which supports OpenSIM, and I'll be serving as the moderator today. I'm pleased to welcome today's presenters, uh, Ann Colin and Tom Vandenberger. Banded Bogert. Uh, they will be presenting metabolic cost modeling, uh, experimental validation, and predictive simulations. Next slide. So OpenSim is a freely available software application for visualizing musculoskeletal structures and simulating movements of humans and animals. Um, and so the goal of our webinar series is to showcase cutting-edge research that's being performed uh, with OpenSim and also other modeling and uh, simulation software. Um, the modeling and simulation community, including those who use OpenSim, is large and ge geographically diverse. And so the second goal of our webinar series is to provide an easy platform for the community to communicate and collaborate. Next slide. Uh, so before we get started, a few quick reminders about the format of the webinar. Uh, we definitely want to have time for questions and take your questions, but we'll do those at the end of the presentation using the Q&A panel. Um, if you need any additional technical help, uh, you can send a chat to Joy, the host of the webinar, uh, or you can consult the guide on our, on our website. Next slide. And so uh, with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, so Ann Colvin is an assistant professor at FAU Erlingen Nuremberg. Uh, previously, she was a postdoc in the BioRob group at EPFL. Uh, she received a Doctor of Engineering degree in Mechanical Engineering from Cleveland State University, uh, where she worked in the Parker Hannafin Laboratory for Human Motion and Control. Uh, under the supervision of our second speaker, Tom Vandenberger. Uh, so Tom is professor at Cleveland State University. He received a PhD in veterinary science from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. He served as the president of the Society of Biomechanics and is well known as the moderator of BiomechL. Some notable awards are the Sports Injury Research Award of the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine and a Technical Achievement Award from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Uh, with that, I will let you guys uh, go ahead and get started with the webinar. Uh, I'm really excited to hear about your work today. Thank you, Jen. Um, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present this webinar. We're very excited about it. Um, so first, a little bit about our uh, any audio yet. No audio. I'm good now. Sorry about that. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sounds great. Um, first, a little bit about our uh, institutional affiliation. So as Jen said, I'm at Cleveland State University, and that's where Anne received her doctoral degree just about a year ago. Uh, and she's now in Germany at um, FAU University, which happens to be close to the Adidas company. And we collaborate with them, and that's why their logo is on this slide as well. So my task today is to present the introduction, and then uh, Anne will take over and present her study on comparison of metabolic models, and then her work on predictive simulations, and then her wrapping it up with some hopefully useful conclusions, and then uh, Jen will take over again to lead the Q&A session. So this work comes out of a very fundamental question about human motion, and that is uh, we have an enormous range of choices in how we move, but we clearly prefer not to do these strange movements. We prefer to walk normally, for instance, and uh, that suggests that there must be an underlying reason or an underlying principle um, that governs our movement. And the two prevailing hypotheses are uh, that we minimize our use of energy or that we minimize fatigue. Um, that's not only an important fundamental question, but there are very uh, important practical applications as well. Because if we know uh, what humans minimize when they choose their movement, and if we can uh, represent that in a computational model, then we can actually predict movement. 
and then we can in that model we can change uh, the mechanical environment and predict how they respond to mechanical interventions and those could be treatments like surgery prosthesis um, nerve blocks that influence muscle activation but also sports shoes to see how they might influence injuries or performance so this ability to predict how humans move that is uh, referred to as the holy grail of biomechanics if you forgive me one more monty python reference so uh, back to these hypotheses of minimizing energy costs or fatigue they both uh, are, are appealing uh, minimizing energy costs makes some sense uh, in evolution because if your survival is challenged by a limited supply of food then obviously you would like your your fuel to last as long as possible, which means you have to minimize your energy consumption. Uh, what's also appealing is that you can, can study these things experimentally because energy costs can be measured through oxygen uptake. Um, and, and then finally, these this hypothesis has given some remarkable explanations of behavior and uh, one, one study like that is shown on the right side. It's a paper by Selinger from a few years ago where they um, used a computer controlled knee brace to uh, manipulate the energy cost of movement. And they programmed it so that certain step frequencies would be more costly than others. And subjects were consistently able, without even knowing what was being done to them, they were able to pick the step frequency that minimizes energy. Um, minimizing fatigue also makes sense. Um, and fatigue is typically thought as being related to muscle activation. Um, it, fatigue determines endurance. So if a muscle is fatigued and can no longer produce the force that's required for the task, then obviously you have to stop performing that task. Um, fatigue is usually defined as a mathematical function of activation, uh, which can be the sum of squared or cubed muscle activations. There's not really a good physiological basis for that, but there are some nice mathematical properties. Uh, for instance, um, activation-based cost functions can explain load sharing. Um, the example is that if you have two muscles that can contribute to a task, um, and one muscle is doing a lot more than the other one, that doesn't really affect the energy cost so much, but it does affect fatigue, obviously, because that muscle that does most of the work will get fatigued much more quickly. Um, so it's still an open question uh, which what it is that humans actually minimize in, in, in choosing how to move. And it's not just it's whole body movement that we're interested in. So it's not just behavior, it's also details like joint angles, and um, how the muscles are recruited. So if you want to test these hypotheses, you have to do something that we call predictive simulation. It requires a musculoskeletal model. You have to have a mathematical definition of the cost function that you want to minimize. And then you run an optimization to predict what the optimal movement would be for a specified task. And in that process, you are not using any data on, uh, on human motion. You're just predicting movement based on that cost function. And then when you have that prediction, then you compare it to actual human motion data to see how good your prediction is. The one study like that is shown on the right. There are several others, but I'm citing this one because they use OpenSim with the Umberger 2010 energy model that comes with OpenSim. You can see in the graphs that they've got quite nice predictions of knee angle and ankle angle uh, and that compare well to uh, how, how humans uh, walk. Um, there isn't really a conclusion yet about what is the best cost function. Um, you see studies like this, but few of them have actually done formal comparisons between energy-based and activation-based uh, cost functions. And then also there are a lot of uh, methodological challenges still. So these optimization problems are very hard. Uh, it's hard to get a solution. If you do get a solution, it could be a local optimum. 
And then that means that the solution has become somewhat dependent on the initial guess that you gave that optimization problem. And you have to be careful with that because if the initial guess is somehow derived from normal human movement, then your prediction could actually have been biased a little bit um, and make it more likely to predict normal movement. Um, another challenge is that we don't really know what is a good model for metabolic energy consumption in muscles. Uh, there are several models and if you pick one and you use that for your prediction and the prediction isn't good, it doesn't really disqualify the metabolic energy hypothesis. It could just mean that you're model wasn't good. And that's the motivation for this comparison study where we took how, uh, how good they are. And I'll go through that a little bit. So all of these models are based on a model for energy rate E dot. It's often expressed as the uh, rate of energy consumption per kilogram of muscle mass. You have to multiply it by the muscle mass then do a summation over all the muscles, then do an integration over time to get the total work uh, or the total energy consumed. And then you divide by uh, the duration of the movement, the total body mass and the walking velocity to get the cost of uh, locomotion in joules per kilogram body weight per meter of distance travel. So the first four of those uh, seven models are based on papers by Umberger, uh, Lichtwark, Hodeck, and um, uh, Bargava. They all have a uh, similar form and they're all based on the first law of thermodynamics, which says that the energy consumed is equal to the mechanical work that's being done, plus the heat that is produced by the muscle. And that heat, there are three terms in that equation that's activation heat, maintenance heat, and the shortening and lengthening heat. And all of these papers, they define equations for those heat terms based on uh, single muscle uh, experiments, such as those were done by um, A.V. Hill in the 1930s on frog muscles, uh, where the heat production was actually measured. Um, but of course, it's not really clear how that extends to a full body human movement. And Minetti's model, um, lumps all these terms together into a single term and all you need to know is the activation of the muscle and uh, the uh, fiber shortening velocity and then that's combined into an, uh, an empirical function to get that energy rate. Uh, there is an old model by uh, Margaria uh, that is based on uphill and downhill walking data uh, and it's just based on efficiency. It basically says the amount of uh, energy that you consume is proportional to the amount of mechanical work that's done. And then for shortening muscle, there's an efficiency assumed of 25% and for lengthening muscle, the efficiency would be 120%. Um, that is a very simple model that we've also tested. And then the final one is the one by Kim and Roberts. And that's defined on joint level variables. So joint uh, angular velocity, Q dot, and the joint motor M. So what's nice about that is that you don't need muscles in your model. Um, and this model has been uh, calibrated or fitted to level walking data, but it's not really clear how good it is for more general movements. So this is now the point where uh, Anne will take over and present her study where these seven models were uh, compared to uh, experimental data. So um, for a metabolic model comparison, we used an experimental approach so that we could take oxygen ox uh, uptake measurements as well to use as a gold standard. So we had an experiment. Have you shared your slides? Great. We have now. Yes, we can. All right. So we, uh, like I said, we did an experiment 
We had 12 subjects, six males and six females who were young, healthy, uh, mostly graduate students from Cleveland State University. And all of them uh, runs, walked six trials on our instrumented treadmill, which is shown on the right. There were two speeds and three inclines of a negative uh, slope of 8% and a positive slope of 8% and a level walking trial. And so the measurements we took uh, were the oxygen consumption and the respiratory quotient to find what we call the measured metabolic cost. And then we used a marker set with 27 markers and a force plate in the instrument, a treadmill, to uh, determine what we call the calculated metabolic cost, which we determine as follows. So we had marker data and force plate data, and we used a inverse kinematic base with the marker data to find the joint angles. So we had markers at the joint uh, center of location, uh, and so for each segment, so we had a thigh, a shank, uh, a, th a thigh, a lower leg, and a foot. And for each, we determined the orientation based on these, um, these markers. And then we used those to find the joint angles. Then we used Winter's method for each of these segments to find the, um, the joint moment at the proximal end. And then finally, we ran a dynamic optimization to find the muscle states. So here on the right, you see a picture with, um, of our model. We had eight muscles in each leg, which were modeled as three element hill type models, muscles with a contractile element with activation dynamics, a force length and force re velocity relationship, a parallel elastic element and a series elastic element. And so we solved an optimal control problem where we minimized the square muscle activation as was proposed by De Grote et al. in 2016. So we optimize over the activation, the contractile element length, and the stimulation to, uh, to find the set of inputs and states that um, provided the moments that were found with Winter's method while following the dynamics. So following the activation dynamics, the force length relationship, and the force velocity relationship. Then based on that, with the muscle states, we used um, the metabolic energy models, or in case of Kim and Robert's model, we used the joint velocities and joint moments to find the calculated metabolic cost. And we used the oxygen optic. Um, we used Weir's equation to find the measured metabolic cost. So Weir's equation is given here. It uses as input the respiratory quotient, so the ratio of oxygen that's inhaled and carbon dioxide that is exhaled. And the second input is the oxygen consumption. And then we, we use the equation to find the metabolic work rate in watts per kilogram of body weight. And then we divide this value by the speed to get the metabolic energy cost in joules per kilogram per meter. So here you can see the results on the right. We have seven graphs with calculated metabolic cost. And the graph in the bottom right is the measured metabolic cost from the pulmonary gas exchange. And so if we take a look at this graph first, you can see that we have six black lines, two downhill, two level, and two uphill trials. And then uh, above each line is indicated the speed um, of the trial. And what you uh, and then for each of the seven calculated metabolic costs, you can see that the line is split up into three. So we separated the energy expended by the hip, the knee, and the ankle. And so if you look at these graphs and compare them to the pulmonary gas exchange values, you can see that the model by Minetti and Alexander um, predicts the metabolic cost best in absolute sense. Most other models underestimate the metabolic cost, and the model by Margaria um, actually slightly overestimates the metabolic cost. The next thing that we looked at was the, uh, how the cost increased or decreased with the slope. You can see again in the bottom right that the measured metabolic cost increased from downhill to level to uphill. And actually all models were able to predict this as well. Another thing that we compared was the cost between the speeds. Again, in the bottom right, you can see that the metabolic cost between the two speeds is pretty similar. And there were, an ex especially model, the model by Minetti and Alexander was able to predict this as well. And to a lesser extent, the model by Lichtwerk, which is the second on the right, and the model by Bargava, which is the upper one on the left, uh, also predicted a pretty similar, similar cost. All other models uh, predicted an increase, 
from 0 0.8 to 1.3 meters per second, except model, the model by Umberger et al., which predicted a decrease. Finally, we compared the energy cost uh, between the joints. And what you can see uh, between the slopes was that there is especially an increase in the work in the hip. This is, for example, visible in the model by Margaria and the model by Benetti, on which are both the third in the line. And then between the speeds from 0 0.8 to 1.3 meters per second, we observed in most models that there was a shift from a, a relatively more uh, energy expended in the knee to relatively more energy expended in the ankle at 1.3 meters per second. However, for our predictive gait simulation, we're not necessarily interested in the absolute uh, predictions, but we want to be, see if the model is able to predict a change in metabolic cost following a change in dynamics. So what we're interested in is the relative error and less the absolute error. And so to score the models on this ability, we used a repeated measures correlation. In a repeated measures correlation, there's a model is fitted y of i, is equal to a x of i plus b i, where i is the subject. And so that means that you get a graph, as is shown on the right, where we have the same slope for each subject, but a different intercept. And our input is the calculated metabolic cost and the output is a measured metabolic cost. And so in this way, you get a separate model for each subject based on the six data points of the six trials that they did, whereas the conventional correlation finds only one relationship for all data. And this model is also applicable to new subjects. So here you see a result, the result of the repeated measures correlation for all seven models. And what uh, you can see is that almost all models, except the model by Margaria, have a slope that is higher than one. So on the horizontal axis, you have the calculated metabolic cost. On the vertical axis, the measured metabolic cost. And there is a dashed black line that shows the slope equal to one. You can see that most models are actually have a higher slope, which means that especially um, movements that take a lot of metabolic energy are underestimated. And what you can also see is that the model by Margaria has a slope equal to one, which means that it is best able to predict a change in metabolic cost in an absolute sense. However, if you look at the correlation, the correlation of model Margaria is actually lowest, but it's still quite high. It's equal to 0 0.9. And actually, the model by Bargava et al. and Lichtwerk and Wilson have the highest correlation of 0 0.96. So now to discuss these results. We observed that the simple models by Minetti and Alexander and Margaria performed quite well. Margaria uh, was best able to predict an increase in metabolic cost, and Minetti and Alexander predicted the absolute cost best. However, you should note here that the model by Margaria was based on data of slope walking, so it might not perform as well for another uh, change in dynamics. And also uh, the absolute value depends not only on the model, but also on the resting metabolic cost that we chose to subtract and where's equation, because there's different equations that can be used to go from oxygen uptake to uh, metabolic cost. And you can see an overview in KIP et al, for example. Secondly, not only uh, the metabolic model is important, but the combination of the musculoskeletal and the metabolic model. So it means if our musculoskeletal model isn't, isn't accurate, this, this could also affect our results. So we checked our kinetic and kinematic da da data, and they were similar to previous work. And also the muscle force that we found was similar to EMG data of winter in Yak, which gives confidence that our musculoskeletal results are accurate. And finally, the handling of energy expenditure during lengthening is still debated. In this work, negative work was subtracted, which is um, physically not very realistic. So we repeated this work without subtracting the negative work. And we found, um, we found a slightly lower correlation, but it was very similar. So that means that this handling does not really change our results very much. So in conclusion, we found that all models correlated well with experimental metabolic cost. And because of the high correlation, we selected the model by Bargava et al. and Lichtwerk and Wilson to be used as objective and predictive simulations. 
So now we move on to the predictive simulations. So again, our aim was to compare the objective of effort minimization to metabolic cost minimization. And our approach is to use direct collocation and a gradient-based optimization, because this is a fast way of, of solving the optimization problem. However, we have a problem here because metabolic models do not have a continuous first derivative, which is required for the algorithm that we use. So the steps we took was to first create and validate a continuous version of the metabolic model, then set up and solve trajectory optimization problems, then compare the results of trajectory, trajectories that were found by effort and metabolic cost minimization. So uh, for the smoothing, in the interest of time, we cannot go over exactly what was done to do this, but we will use the general, we will present the general approach that we used. So we identified two reasons for the discontinuities. One was there was a dependency on stimulation time. And the second was that there were different equations used for shortening and lengthening, which created a discontinuity around the isometric case where there was no velocity. So first, we take a look at the dependency on stimulation time. This causes a discontinuity because direct, in direct collocation, you take a derivative with respect to the states and input at each collocation node or each time point. And so if uh, a muscle is active in a certain iteration at some time point, but then it's not active in the next iteration, it means that the derivative disappears, which creates this discontinuity. And our solution was quite simple. We used an average value of stimulation time, which we based on, on data of previous uh, of walking that we had. The second uh, discontinuity requires some more work. And so um, we identified two causes, uh, two different options of uh, discontinuities around the shortening and lengthening velocity. The first is when the equation is a function of the CE velocity. So that means that the output is equal to uh, F1 of FCE when the muscles are lengthening, and it's equal to F2 of the velocity when the muscles are shortening. And an example of this is the shortening and lengthening heat rate. So our solution was to define two velocities, a shortening velocity and a lengthening velocity. And you can see the shortening velocity in the top right. I, and you can see that the shortening velocity is equal to the velocity when the muscle is shortening and equal to zero otherwise. And similarly, we have a lengthening velocity, which is equal to zero when the muscle is shortening and equal to the velocity when the muscle is lengthening. And you can see here the equations that we used for this. And then to find the output, we summed uh, the two functions, F1, which is a function of the lengthening velocity, and F2, which is a function of the shortening velocity, because we know that one of them will be equal to zero, except around zero. And then um, another thing you can see is by changing epsilon, we can create an increasingly nonlinear um, equation, which is a better representation of reality. Then the second case is when the equation of not a function of the shortening velocity. So that means that the output is equal to, for example, A when the muscle is lengthening and B when the muscle is shortening. And remember here that A and B could be um, a function of, for example, the muscle stimulation. And so an example of this is the maintenance heat rate in a model by Lechbork and Wilson. And so our solution here is to use a cosine of X around between minus epsilon pi and zero. So that means if the muscle is lengthening, the output is equal to B, B, A, sorry. And when it's shortening, but uh, smaller than minus epsilon times P, pi, it is equal to B. And then between minus epsilon pi and zero, it's equal to the cosine. And this works because the derivative of the cosine is equal to zero at minus epsilon times P and zero, which means that the derivative is continuous despite we, the fact that we are using three separate functions. And again, by using a smaller e, we are able to create an increasingly nonlinear function, which is a better representation of the original function. Another option would be to use the arc tangent, but because this is, function is asymptotic, uh, the, the approach with the cosine will lead to a slightly more accurate result. So now to um, 
to validate these models and see how well they represent the original model, we used uh, gate simulations where we calculated the metabolic cost with both the original and the smooth model. These gate simulations were created for 20 virtual subjects drawn from a uh, weight and length distribution as shown here. And also the muscle parameters were varied 5% around the original value. And we created simulations at four speeds, at two walking speeds and two running speeds. And here on the right, you see the results which are grouped uh, for per color for each of the, of the speeds. And on the horizontal axis, you see the metabolic cost in a continuous model. And the vertical axis, you see the metabolic cost in the original model. And you see that the correlation is very good. And also our correlation coefficients were very high. They were more than 0 0.99 for both models. One thing that you might have noticed is that the continuous model of Lichtwerk and Wilson overestimates the metabolic cost by a lot. However, again, we're mostly interested in the relative uh, differences, so the absolute value is not as important to us. And we found that these models are a very good representation of the original model. So now we have everything ready to set up our trajectory optimization problems. Here, the aim is to find the muscle stimulations U of T for a full, full gait cycle from zero to capital T for dynamic system, which is a human model with nine degrees of freedom, the position and orientation of the trunk, two hip angles, two knee angles, and two ankle angles. And this model is uh, operated with 16 hill type muscles, eight in each leg, which are shown over here. And the objective is to minimize either an objective of muscular effort or an objective of metabolic cost while walking one gait cycle at 1.3 meters per second. And so we, sorry. We solved a series of problems uh, from 25 random initial guesses. So for each of these initial guesses, we solved a series of problems with an increasing nonlinearity, so a smaller epsilon, uh, to create a, a, a solution that was uh, a solution that was uh, very nonlinear. While uh, it was possible to do this with our algorithm. And we used direct collocation with 30 nodes per half gate cycle to solve uh, our problems. And here you see uh, three simulations, which are the solutions of our optimizations. And you can see that when effort is minimized, a toe walking solution is adopted. But when metabolic cost is minimized, which is the two graphs on the right, there's heel strike and the uh, gates look quite normal. So now if you look at these results in more detail, here on the right, you can see the joint angle in the hip, the knee and the ankle as a function of the time and percentage of gait cycle. The black line shows the effort minimization solution and the red and blue show the solutions for minimizing metabolic cost where red is Bargava et al and blue is Lichtwerk and Wilson. What you can see for the hip is that all of the solutions follow the the normal walking pattern, which is the blue fill that you can see, which is data from winter. And in, for the hip, they all follow this very well. However, in the knee, you can see that the effort solution, so the black line has increased flexion in stance and decreased flexion in swing. Whereas the, the blue and red line follow um, the normal pattern a lot better. And similarly for the ankle, there's extreme plantar flexion in the, for the effort solution, which is the toe walking you saw before, while the, um, the two metabolic solutions follow again the normal range of motion quite well. But there are no obvious differences between the two metabolic models that were used. So now if we move on to the joint moment, again the black line is effort, red line is Bargavat O and blue line is the model by Lichtwerk and Wilson. And the fail is normal data from winter. But now you can see that actually the effort solution is much more realistic than the uh, solutions minimizing metabolic cost. Um, so as you can see in the hip especially, there is zero joint moment uh, in both the solution by Bar from Bargavas and Lichtwerk models. There's there's no hip moment in stance, which means that it adopts a really risky strategy uh, to, 
to walk, and this is not realistic. And also in the knee, uh, the effort solution follows the, the normal pattern much better than um, the metabolic cost solutions. However, in the ankle, uh, the metabolic cost minimization is somewhat sim more similar to the joint movements because there is an extra peak in the effort solution, which is probably due to the toe walking that was observed. And then finally, here is a graph of the muscle force of each of the muscles that were in the leg. And uh, what you can see is that in the glutes, there is no, uh, there is no force at all in uh, the solutions that minimize metabolic cost. So that means that this muscle is, is not used at all in these solutions. Um, another thing that you can see is, for example, in the vesti and the rectus femoris is that the activation is much more bursty when uh, metabolic cost is minimized compared to when effort is minimized. So uh, as I said before, we used 25 different initial guesses. And with the model from Lichtwerk and Wilson, we were able to find a solution for all. Whereas in the model of Bhargava et al, there were three uh, instances where the algorithm was not able to find a solution. For both models, we found that the best one took advantage of the ground contact model and uh, adopted some physically unrealistic gait. That, um, so we discarded these solutions. But the next four, four were very similar, which gave us confidence that we found a solution close to the global optimum. Then um, the smallest metabolic cost we found, with uh, if we used bar the model from Bhargavad all as objective, we found 1.59 joules per kilogram per meter with this model and 2.46 joules per kilogram per meter by, with the model of Lichtwerk and Wilson. And when we used this model as objective, we found 1.63, so slightly higher with Bhargavad's model and 1.91, which is lower with Lichtwerk and Wilson's model. And this is as expected because we expect the lowest number when we actually use this model as objective. However, what's, what we also notice is that predictive simulations are much more energy efficient than normal walking because we would expect, expect a value in the range of three to four joules per kilogram per meter. Possible reasons for this is that stability is not taken into account. For example, this is obvious with the zero joint moment in stance phase which would not be optimal if there was some uncertainty because this would lead to a fall very quickly. And also we will not have any co-contraction when we minimize for effort or metabolic cost. Secondly, we use a two-dimensional model with only 16 muscles, which means that we disregard any motion out of the outside of the sagittal plane. And also there's many more muscles that perform work and expend energy. So this could also lead to a a smaller energy cost than expected. So to wrap up, in summary, we compared seven metabolic energy against uh, oxygen consumption data, and we found that all correlated well with the correlation coefficient of at least 0 0.9 with experimental data. The best absolute, absolute prediction of a change in metabolic cost was uh, found by the model of Margaria, but the highest correlation was uh, the model by Bhargava et al. and the model by Lichtwerk and Wilson. Then we smoothened the metabolic cost using two equations, depending on whether the non-smooth variable, which we call x for now, was in the equation or not. Then when we compared the objective of effort and metabolic cost in the predictive simulation, we found that we have more realistic joint moments when minimizing effort and more realistic joint angles when minimizing metabolic cost. So uh, to conclude, which model performs the best? Overall, the performance was very similar. All models had a high correlation. And also in our predictions, there were no obvious differences between the model by Bhargava et al. and Lichtwerk and Wilson. So uh, to uh, end with some open questions. First of all, the, we uh, are wondering, sorry, if, um, the underestimation of metabolic cost is going to disappear if we use a three-dimensional model instead of a two-dimensional model, which we have just discussed. Secondly, uh, what we're interested in is to know is how well can the models predict small changes in metabolic cost? Because in this current experiment, we used pretty large differences in slope, so it's not completely unexpected that these models were able to predict that quite well. 
However, in predictive simulations, we would also be interested to, um, to predict a change as small as, for example, 1% in metabolic cost. So an indication could be given by looking at the similarities in speed uh, that were predicted, especially by the model of Minetti and Alexander, and also by the model of Bargava et al. and by Lichtwerk and Wilson. However, this should also be further investigated. Then the third question is, should we take into account environmental uncertainty in the predictions? Because the observed behavior of zero hip moment in stance is very risky and is definitely not optimal in an environment with uncertainty. And we know that people account for uncertainty when choosing movement patterns. And with these predictive simulations, what we're actually doing is modeling this decision process. So therefore, we should probably take this into account to get to more realistic simulations. And then finally, the holy grail of biomechanics. Do humans minimize effort or metabolic cost in walking? Or even possibly, do they optimize a combination? Because this was used uh, recently by Antoine Fallis of Credo de Grotes group at KU Leuven. And they found pretty uh, realistic results with this approach. And um, one option that could be used to research this is infers optimal control, which is done, uh, for example, by Mombauer's group at Heidelberg University. So finally, um, our data set is available on Zenodo. You can see the DOI over here. So we provide pulmonary gas exchange measurements and raw and processed gate analysis data of our 12 subjects. We would also like to acknowledge our co-authors of our two papers, Eva Dorsky and Dieter Heinrich, uh, the Parker Hennepin Laboratory of Promotion and Control where the experiments were, uh, were run, and finally, our funding sources uh, for this work. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tan and Anne, for a really great talk. Super clear and really interesting and thought-provoking. Um, we'll now go ahead and switch over to the Q&A session. So as I said at the beginning, will be text-based, uh, so find the Q&A panel in your WebEx computer, uh, type in your question, and make sure you select to ask all panelists. Um, I'll, I'll ask a question to get started. I wanted to follow up on one of your um, closing points about um, whether humans might um, minimize a combination of effort and metabolic cost. Do you guys have thoughts on the physiological, whether there might be a physiological basis for that? Um, so my take on this is that um, effort or muscle activation is something that humans can quite easily sense. So that is one argument that would point to the fact that um, effort minimization is, is more likely than metabolic cost minimization. Um, and so it's still investigated how exactly humans can measure um, the metabolic cost. So that is one. Uh, however, if um, if there is some sensor for this, then I think it would actually make sense that it is some combination because we try to use as much information as we can uh, to get to to make our decisions. Mm -hmm. And Matan, if you have anything to add to that. Uh, no, no, I think that's pretty much what I'm thinking too, that the uh, possibility to sense it, yeah, then actually use it. Oh, I missed the last part of what you said, Tom. There was some background oh, noise. So if people can sense muscle activation and energy uh, consumption both, then they might be using both of them uh, to decide what movement is best. Okay, great. So now we'll go ahead and... Um, go to questions from the audience. Um, so first, a question from um, Sung Ming Song. Uh, what is the main difference of the presented model and that in Ackerman and Van der Gober from 2010, where effort minimization did not result in toe walking? So in, in 2010, I could probably comment on this since I co-authored that paper. In 2010, we were not very good at this yet. Uh, for instance, we were not able to do random initial guess. So we derived our initial guess from 
uh, simulation of normal walking. And that was then used as an initial guess for the um, predictive simulation. And I'm a little bit skeptical that that's actually a global optimum. Um, and I feel like what Anne has done here is much more thorough and, um, uh, and, and it actually shows that the predictions can get quite bad if you do the optimization properly. Okay, thank you. Um, so a reminder to the audience, please ask your questions in the Q&A panel so we can track them um, rather than the chat panel. Sorry for any confusion there. And we will try to get to all of them in both. Um, Okay, so now a question from Mohamed uh, Shurige. Uh, how can the metabolic models be compared against the experimental data when generic musculoskeletal parameters are used? Um, that is a very good question. Um, I'm not sure exactly what he is alluding to. Um, but yeah, it's definitely true that um, these, the musculoskeletal parameters can affect the solution. And, but, uh, so we checked both our joint angles, our joint moments, and our muscle forces with uh, existing data of other experiments to make sure that uh, those were realistic mm -hmm. to give us confidence in our results. But it's definitely, it's true that these parameters can affect even the metabolic models. I guess another question, did you, uh, a little bit related to this is whether you thought about doing any sensitivity testing of whether you know, variations in the musculoskeletal parameters within what's normal for people might have affected the conclusions. Yeah, we definitely plan to do that, but have not yet done that. Okay. Um, so now a question from Ilona Kessels. Uh, did you also have a look at the model of Umberger from 2010? Yes, uh, we did. So as I mentioned, uh, we decided to d subtract the lengthening work. So we decided to use the model, the original model from 2003, because that one subtracts lengthening. Then when we repeated the experiment without um, subtracting the lengthening work, we actually used the version that was presented in 2010, where um, the variables are slightly different and the lengthening work is not subtracted. And we found also for this model that the correlation was slightly less when, with this version than with the 2003 version. Okay. Um. Right, so I got a question about the volume of my audio. Um, and so hopefully this is a little bit better. Um, let's see, so we'll go on to qu more questions. Uh, now one from uh, Makul Talati. Uh, have you considered including a stability measure in a cost function? Uh, you indicated an environmental uncertainty. How would you model this? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, what we have uh, uh, tried in, pre in uh, before is to instead of optimize one gate cycle, optimize a series of gate cycles and have each have the same open loop control and then have a feedback control to be able to have different input between these different gate cycles. And so each noise is then added to the dynamics and that is one way that we are trying to add the stability or uncertainty into our uh, simulations. But this approach is uh, numerically different, difficult, and it's, so it's still in, in development. Okay. Uh, let's see. So a question from Pierre Pouchard. Uh, could you explain again why the most models are better? Um, yes. So we, we look at correlation because um, yeah, we're interested in the relative change. So it doesn't really matter to us if, if the numbers are, are wrong, as long as we can see what dynamic situation has the lowest metabolic cost. So for example, if you want to design a prosthesis that is very energy efficient, it doesn't really matter maybe what exactly the number is, but which prosthesis, which stiffness value, for example, gives us the lowest uh, metabolic cost. 
And so that is why we looked at the correlation to see how well um, we were able to look at this relative difference. I hope that answers the question. So it did seem like the models that were, you know, best aligned with the um, um, the, the limit, the um, the absolute um, predicting the absolute metabolic cost it had lower um, correlation. Do you do you have thoughts on why? That might be the case, and whether that does matter at all as far as um, predicting differences. Not, not really. So the thing is that we, um, because there's so many factors that influence the absolute number. For example, the resting metabolic length, uh, resting metabolic rate. So we subtracted a rate from uh, standing, whereas others have used sitting before, even walk uh, standing, but with arm swing, for example. And so this number also affects the absolute prediction. And, also, and then secondly, there's Weir's equation, where there's other, also other equations that can be used there, which also affect the absolute numbers. So that's why we never look too much into the absolute predictions, because we, we don't have enough trust in these values. Okay, thank you. Uh, and again, apologies if my audio is still quiet relative to the speakers. Uh, I have mine turned all the way up. Um, let's see. So I'm making sure we've addressed all the questions that have come in. Uh, here's another one, and I'll ask a follow on question to it. So this is from Gang Zhao. Um, is there any study that has compared the movements of young and old people? And to follow on to that, do you think that, you know, the cost function might change between different groups like the younger individuals and elderly individuals? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I am not aware of any studies that have compared that. Um, I doubt if it changes because from an evolutionary perspective, it would not make sense to have the, um, the objective change over time. I don't know if Tan has anything to add about that. Um, it's clearly a, a different movement in, in older people. And it would be very interesting to see if you could explain that based on a predictive simulation. So is it the objective or is it the system that has changed? Um, I would tend to agree with Anne that it's the the system, the, you know, the stiffness in the, in the muscles and that sort of thing that would explain it. But uh, you could explore this with, with the predictive simulation. It would be interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we'll take one more question. This is from Bjorn Jensen. Um, could you elaborate on your thoughts regarding energy transfer between segments and the cost of eccentric work in your calculated metabolic cost? Um, I'm not sure what exactly he means with energy transfer. That is not something we looked at. Um, is is possible? Uh, there's dynamic coupling. There are two joint muscles, so that that capability is there. So if the optimization wants to take advantage of it, it did that. Um, and then what was the second part? Yeah, so the question again, elaborating on energy transfer between segments and the cost of eccentric work. All right. Yeah. So eccentric work. Um, so some of that uh, eccentric work ends up as energy storage in the, in the elastic elements. Um, some of it uh, happens in the contractile element. And then in our model, uh, which physiologically, as Anne said, doesn't really make sense in our model. It's like uh, you stretch the muscle fibers and uh, that makes, uh, that gives you some energy back. And that shouldn't, you know, in physiology, that's not happening like that, but it turned out to be better for the modeling. Okay. Um, one follow-up to our discussion about um, 
aging and cost. So um, there's a paper song in Geyer in the Journal of Physiology where they did uh, look at walking performance and aging. Uh, so to the um, person who asked the question about that, um, you might be interested in checking out that paper. Um, we have a little bit more time, so I did have one more question come in from Thomas Geitenbeek. Um, is there a specific reason the Minetti model wasn't used in the predictive simulation since it would seem like the easiest to implement? Um, let's see, I, I think I implemented all at some point in the last four years. Um, but yeah, so we just, yeah, we used these because they had the highest correlation, but I don't remember exactly the, if it was the model of Minetti, but we implemented all others and the results were very similar between all of the seven models when we used them as predictive simulation. Okay. But if you have yeah, more detailed questions, you could contact me about that. Okay. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap up since it's almost 11 o'clock. There are a couple closing slides. Um, if you guys could click through those once you, when you get a chance. Um, so thank you again, Anne and Tan, for a great talk. And thank you to everyone in the audience for all the great questions. Uh, next slide. Uh, I want to acknowledge the funding sources for OpenSIM and the NCSRR were supported by several grants from the NIH, including the NIH grant that funds our National Center for Simulation and Rehab Research. Next slide. You can find more information about the center, upcoming events, and other resources from the OpenSIM community on our website. Uh, we also ask that you fill out the survey that will appear in a pop-up window at the conclusion of the webinar. This will help us improve the webinar series and choose upcoming topics. Uh, following the webinar, you'll get an email uh, with a link to a recording of the webinar as well as, as, well as links to uh, materials that were discussed during the webinar. So you can, for example, get a link to the data set that Ann and Tom have shared. Um, and with that, uh, I'll go ahead and close the webinar. Thank you again uh, to Ann and Tom. Thank you to everyone in the audience for participating. Uh, we hope you'll continue to stay involved with OpenSim and the modeling and simulation community. Thank you guys.